point is just simply just an abject acceptance of my life being a bust. That's what I've done. I, I, I am absolutely beat. I accept that. It's an abject statement of failure, this thing of admission. My life's out of whack, and if I drink, I'm in a lot of trouble. It ain't a good place to roost. And the way our program is, is laid out, I wouldn't change one nuance of, of, of that because it was probably the most critical thing in the program for me. Well, how do you deal with a hopeless, helpless guy who is spiritually drank bankrupt, who's angry at anything that even rhymes with God? How do you approach that? And, and the genius of, of what developed in those, that early crucible of Alcoholics Anonymous, that Burwell stuff you were talking about, those, those debates about God as we understand Him. Thank God for the people who argued. <clears throat> because what we came out with was a thing that will fit even a guy like me. And you know what it says, but let me say it anyway. What, what it says is that for, for, for a guy like me is that we come to believe that, not in, but that, a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. Hope is what that's about. Come to believe. Thank God it didn't say we got converted. If every conversion I went through had taken, I don't know what I'd be. <laughs> I mean, a gang of them, but they, it never had any meaning. You know, it just, I, for most people, stuff I went to worked well. didn't work for me. just did not connect. And so it's, what we say is that we come to believe. i tell you something I'm deeply grateful for at Alcoholics Anonymous. In this program, you'll find me a pretty practical type of guy. In this program, we start where we are. Now, that sounds simple. But how many people want to start at their place in the world or they start where they, where they ought to be or where they want to be next year? Critically important for me that I start where I am, and I don't care where that is. We start. I don't care if you're a fire-breathing atheist. That's where we start. Start where we are. Very important for me to get in touch with the reality of who I am in regard to what my beliefs are. One of the things that I had to deal with, and it took a little time, was the fact that I had always lived in this kind of turmoil produced by knowing that there was a lot of what I had been exposed to in organized religion I simply didn't believe. Now, that's tough kind of stuff to deal with when you're confused and lost and growing up. But I had that with me as a 24-year-old guy trying to come alive in Alcoholics Anonymous. One of the things I had to do was say it out loud to myself and identify things that I simply didn't believe. Except the fact that that's so. And if that's so, then what do you believe? Very important for me. The freedom, certainly. The freedom to start where I am the responsibility to start where I am. Nobody's going to give me this. And if I want to get hold of something, it's up to me to find the power that makes sense to me. Now, I've never understood from a theoretical design what God's about or this kind of thing. Now, I always wanted to picture some old magician in the air that would perform tricks till I believed in him or something, you know, that... I mean, it was just that kind of fairy tale kind of thing. I, I never could stop trying to define God as some picture. People told me all my life, if you want to find God, look within. <laughs> Don't look without. I'd heard that, but I never understood it. I never accepted that until I found it to be true. And so when I started to take a look, there were some things that, that had some impact on me. One, there's a story in the book. A young fella in a hospital room. And in the, right toward the end of his story, he, he's saying over and over, who are you to say there's no God? Who are you to say there's no God? Boy, did I ever connect with that. And I started to do the same thing. Who are you to say there's no God? Of all the learned folk in this world, all of the people that you respect highly who have deep beliefs, you're going to be arrogant enough to 
just stand up and contradict that. That was an important baby step for me, but a critically important baby step. What our book says is that just a willingness to believe is quite enough. And so that's what started to emerge with that kind of thinking. Instead of having periods and exclamation points, I started to introduce a question. Well, maybe. Well, maybe. Maybe I'm not the end-all, be-all and can just declare a moratorium on, 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 on spirituality. Important kind of a start. i tell you what, what started to penetrate for me. Yeah, I mentioned about that group I was in being the place where I learned to trust. At least the birth of trust. It's also the place where I found the birthplace of a power. Now, I couldn't have explained it. I couldn't even understand it myself. But over time, I started to sense something in that group that was bigger than me, that was bigger than us. There was a power that permeated that room, 300 hairy-legged convicts. <coughs> and I'm not talking about the collective energy of 300 convicts. I'm talking about a power that was greater than any of us and made us better than we would otherwise be. I, I, I tell you what was, uh, what was really significant to me. Like, I've never seen God. I've, I've never had a conversation with God. I, I think... I think my higher power speaks to me in many ways, and we'll talk about that some, but, but I've never... Uh, well, I did have God, God or somebody talk to me uh, quite often when I was drinking. <laughs> that, it was somebody I couldn't see anyway. I, but I've never, I've never had that. i tell you where I see God. And I see it all the time. But I'll tell you where I first saw it. I saw guys who by their own description had committed acts of cruelty that defied imagination. And I've watched those same guys <coughs> perform acts of kindness, courtesy, love, second to none. Well, when I see that, I see what God's about. I see God in what His kids do. I see it when I watch my fellow members deal with their own mortality. I'm, I, con I never cease being amazed at how the overwhelming majority of AA members deal with death. Went to see a guy down at Kitty Hawk, at uh, Kill Devil Hills. Old Isaac, I don't know if you remember him or not. The, uh, he was a homely little old man. His, uh, his wife dressed him up all the time. He wore little caps. He looked like an organ grinder monkey. Is, is what he, <laughs> but, but he was a great guy and a long-term member of AA. And uh, I, was, I was in another state. Somebody told me he was, he was dying. I, so I, I, I worked out a way to get over and went over to see him. And this, this is what I'm talking about. It, it's amazing where you see God. I went down unannounced, just walked in his room, and he was delighted to see me. And, and uh, I said, well, tell me how you're doing, buddy. And he, he spent max of two minutes, maybe, just sort of telling me and, uh, you know, what was happening. And then all at once, he just beamed and he said, tell me about the kids. <laughs> Damn, excuse me. I swear to God, I believe I'm on a joke. The, uh, but now that's a phenomenal thing. Eh? Here, here's a guy less than a week away from death. The minute he shifted his attention to something else, he lit up. Just lit up. And we had a great visit. That's a, a, enormously impressive to me. To watch people do things like that. To watch somebody greet a newcomer and hug somebody who hadn't had a bath for a month. <laughs> I see God's simple things. But they're looking over that ocean. Let's see God.
See, the, the, it, it was in learning to see God where He was instead of some riddle, you know, but a very real force in the lives of people. And so I started to believe. I certainly couldn't have explained my belief to anybody. Didn't have to. All I have to do is believe that. That power can restore me. God is understanding. The other thing that I not only deeply appreciate the starting where we are, I appreciate very much the fact that we are not about getting good. We're about getting well. And if goodness comes, too bad. It's just, it just happens sometimes in spite of us. I guarantee you I've gotten better than I ever meant to get. I, 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 swear, I, I didn't mean to do this. Man. I don't do anything. I, mean, I am a square. I, <laughs> my worst fears all come true. I, I, <laughs> No, it ain't bad, I tell you. I've learned what real living is about. And I kid about it, but by golly, it's, 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 um, it, it is true. I never meant to get it. But it just happens, eh? And he come to believe that. You know, that I really like, I didn't notice that for a long time, but the step, we, we spend so much time talking about what we believe in. But what step says, came to believe that, that puts it to work. Do I believe that power can restore me? What a start. And then the, the, you know, it's a simple proposition that if I believe that, then the next step is, well, then am I willing to turn my will in life over? A tricky, tr- tricky kind of transaction for a guy like me because I genuinely did have those fears of wearing long robes and sandals and hustling quarters. I, I really was... was uh, <laughs> was resistant to purity. I, and, and I just, every time I would pray, I would pray earnestly, and then I'd find myself saying, well, wait, not yet now. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> and that was the way I felt, you know. It's it, it kind of like, it, 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 you know, that during that period. A funny thing about this sort of, sort of uh, 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 some folks call it approach avoidance stuff, yeah, I would, uh, if I walked past somebody's having a meeting, I'd say, what's, what's that meeting about third step? And I'd say, oh, jeez, you know, I don't want to. But I'd go. <laughs> so I'm hunting it, but I'm afraid about, about how much it takes. Tremendously important for me to keep my feet on the ground about what I'm doing. Very important for a guy. Now, you know, some people are very comfortable with religion. They're not threatened by any of this. Great. But for those of us who are aggravated cases, in that spiritual department, I found it tremendously important to, to keep a clear look at what I'm doing. See, my great fear, one of my great fears was being restored to what drove me nuts as a kid. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be restored to that today. You know, I have absolutely nothing against, against folk, but there are some things that, that, that go under the heading of organized religion that are anything but and uh, so, not interested in that. What was tremendously important for me was to remember the power that I believe in. What I've come to believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. What it says, come to believe that a power greater than me can restore me to sanity. Very important for me to hang on to that. To keep my feet on the ground and not get lost into some inflated notion of what I'm talking about. So, makes it a kind of a practical thing. When I'm doing it that way and I'm in tune and not frightened with imagination, to simply say, well, if you believe in it, you use it, use it, and turn my will and my life over. I never expected God to make a spiritual robot out of me. When I first heard people talking about living a spiritual life, I couldn't a bit more relate to that to man than money. It sounded to me like what they were saying if they were driving in downtown Jacksonville and no place to park, they'd just pray and somebody's Volkswagen would just disappear <laughs> and, uh, and they got a plate. That's, that's what it sounded like. 
Now, I swear to God, I say stuff sounds like that. <laughs> but it's different with me now. I, mine, is, mine is a lot more pragmatic. <laughs> but, but it is truly an, an amazing thing about, of, 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 of how the spiritual life becomes. I, I just dwell on it this much, a, a little bit. Now, let's see. What time we quit, boss? When you're done. No, no, no. God knows that's dangerous. <laughs> what does it say? 11.30 or 12? Yeah, yeah, quarter. Up. All right, we'll be done by quarter. Up. Let, me, let, me, let me just dwell on that just a little bit more. Cause that, now, this is just me, but, but that, 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 who you got? I mean, next year it'll be somebody else doing something. <laughs> let, let, let me tell you what the spiritual life means. One day, one day I, I was in, in O'Hare Airport in Chicago. It seemed like it's been half my life. There. So I, I'm, 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 in the, I'm, I'm in the airport, and I'm, I'm walking down to wherever I'm going, and all at once I realize I'm grinning. <laughs> well, you don't do that in airports. I mean, you... <laughs> you if you watch people in an airport, uh, if you like to study people, you watch them, and I do it a lot. Everybody's mad. I mean, the, the, the welcome wagon is mad when, when the airport. Everybody's mad. And you ain't happy with nothing. And well, you look like a fool walking in. <laughs> so, so I realized what I was doing, and I stopped and I put on my airport face and went on down and chewed somebody out. You know, but but isn't that dumb? You know, no, I thought about that. I, I thought about that later. That what a great moment. Yeah. Now if Bill Wilson had that experience, he would have written a book about it. Yeah. <laughs> he was a lot more wordy than me. But what happened? I, I read a, an article in the Grapevine that a, a, a lady wrote an article called Moments. Moments. Probably one of the finest articles I read because it addressed what I was sort of feeling. And what she was talking about was when things come together, we experience moments that are larger than life. They're, they're, they're moments that you just light up when everything is just right. And, and it got me thinking about that experience. And, and what I found is that it, doing God's will and having the power be a living force in my life it's not some real mystical sounding kind of thing. It's, it, it's powerful. But what I found is that when I am who I'm supposed to be, no sham, no pretense, when I'm who I'm supposed to be, true to what I believe in, and I'm where I'm supposed to be, doing what I'm supposed to be doing, then I have moments on a regular basis. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I, I used to be a fair golfer. I'm, I'm almost an ex-golfer now, but I used to be fair. One day, I, I, I was out at the course and practicing, and a guy sponsored a disabled fellow got a, with a heart condition. And another fellow said, come join us. Well, back then, I was playing fairly well. And, uh, I mean, I wasn't a pro, but I was better than I ever meant to be there, too. And uh, I, I went on, well... The, the, the two old boys could just barely hit it out of their shadow, you know. And, and so I'm sort of, I'm sort of laying back, you know, just kind of trying to lay with them, playing comfortably in my limits. Eh? And and so I got on the eighth hole, and realized that I was three under par. <laughs> and uh, birdied the next hole, and and uh, on the front foot. Now now here I am, just a, a little above average golfer, but not that good. I tied the course record. Wasn't even trying. Tied the course record. So now, guess what an alcoholic mind does? <laughs> we stopped and had our obligatory Coke at the thing, which I didn't like. But we had it in a hot dog. And we got on the back, and I said, man, I'm going to tear him up back here. I'll really tear this sucker up. I shot 32-47. <laughs> That's with me in charge. <laughs> and, and see, the only thing that happened in that front one, 
was that I would just I turn loose, eh? I turn loose and just let the natural things stay within my limits, stay just sort of carrying out. There's a guy named one of our old boys named Mr. Jordan from Wilmington, Michael Jordan. Fair got the, the basketball player. And and he he always struck me with something. It's been rerun a thousand times, I know. It was a game where um, they were playing somebody, and he had one of those blind nights that he could not miss. I mean, the guy could just try to slam it on the floor and he'd go in. I, and he was just hitting them from everywhere. And I, I, I don't know, he had something like 50 some points or something. And at one point, he was trotting down the court and he looked over at the opposing bench and he just did like that. Yeah. He said, don't ask me, you know. And later on, he described that as being in a zone. And now that's almost a, a catch phrase in, in, in so many things about being in a zone. When somebody just goes beyond your own expectation and just effortlessly do things that would normally be a challenge. And to me, that's exactly what the spiritual life is. When, when, I'm, when I'm in that zone where I'm in tune with the power, see, my power lives down here in my soul. And when I'm in tune with that power and doing what I would do and not putting up resistance to it, and I get into that flow, I tell you, I'm about as tough as they come. About as tough as they come. In whatever venue. And it doesn't mean I'm superhuman. It just means I get myself out of the way. And when I do that, my God, it's amazing what happens. And those things that happen that are, uh, that are remarkable... I've almost quit being surprised. Yeah. And, and so that's my deal. When I, when I get to, 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 to fight in life and i got aggravations and I'm worried about stuff, almost invariably it's because I'm operating out here somewhere and I'm trying to fix this or solve that or wrestle with this. But when I get back in and I am crystal clear about who I am and about what I'm about and about who's in charge, and I'm just trying to carry it out to the best of my ability and be as honest as I know how to be. Amazing what happens. What this part talks about <coughs> in, in this, to me, I, you won't find it written anywhere, but I, I like to look at this part of our program, those first three steps, as, as, as the foundation for recovery. They're certainly about relief and release and about, uh, about uh, the ability to, 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 to stay sober. I would not make a case that you can't stay sober if you don't go on beyond this. I wouldn't try to make that case because I've had too much evidence to the contrary. I've known people who've never gone beyond step three, who've never done an inventory, who've died sober. I've known people who've never read the book, who've died sober. What it comes down to me is what am I satisfied with? What am I satisfied with? If I stopped right now, and, and I didn't, but if I had stopped right now, maybe I could have made it if all I wanted to do was survive. If I just wanted to get by. If I just wanted to have a day at peace without drinking, it would be okay. I could probably do that. I've seen people do that. But I'm not that kind of guy. I'm a kind of guy who's driven by things. You know, my life was not torn up just by drinking. My life was a mess. My life was as big a mess without drinking as it was drinking. It just looked a lot different, smelled different, but it was still a mess. And if I had stopped there, I don't think I would have wanted to live with the guy. So I like to look at these first three steps as the place where we at least get a spiritual foundation, where I start to accept, even grudgingly, that, man, I'm in a heap of trouble. But there's hope. You know, there's something here. There's a power by which I can survive. And it's a great starting place. I, I just can't personally buy it as a stopping place. Because the rest of the prayer, to me, that, that part's about uh, simply surrender and about my relationship with the power. And then we move into to what I think is a 
tremendously important part of the program where we start to look at the relationship with ourselves. You know, what is it that drives this dude? What is it? What's my alcoholism look like? And, and so that's where we, we go from there. That, so that's, that's the, the first three for me. We could talk about it all day, but I couldn't say any more. <laughs> Thanks. We'll have lunch. <laughs> Thank you. I like it going in retirement. That's, that's the longest break I've ever had at a workshop. <laughs> See, now, what were we on? <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> it was a great lunch, eh? Man, a lot. I don't think I've ever seen boogers like that at uh, just, just an average place. And hot dogs, good God. <laughs> Look like salami on a bun or something. I mean, a whole roll of salami. <laughs> that, that was a killer. Uh, neat stuff. It's, uh, so far, it's just been a real treat working with you guys. That's uh, been a... It's a you know, sometimes the... Uh, the the communication is, is there, you know, and, and it's surely a two-way street. And even though I've been doing most of the talking, I guarantee you the communication has been just excellent, and uh, I really appreciate that. When you you got one got a one-note samba going on for this long. It's uh, it can sort of wear you down sometimes. Uh, so, so you guys have been good, and uh, I have to tell them back home that you <laughs> be proud of you. <laughs> I've done a little group evaluation, and and uh, so far I've concluded that there's not a person in here ought to drink anymore. <laughs> well, we uh, we're moving right along. I got what I've got in mind on this session is to to kind of make up for what I got off on this this morning, and so what what I try to do is go through. Uh, uh, four through seven in this session, and then uh, we'll do the uh, the men's stuff tonight, and maybe sneak something else in. But uh, but but at a minimum, we do the the men's thing, and then tomorrow we'll uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, <laughs> several people asked me if I ever got out of jail, and uh, <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and, so maybe we could work out a little of the rest of the story about you, know, and then what happened. You know, some of it's kind of built into what we're doing, but uh, but we, we'll just kind of finish up on on uh, you know what it's like now and kind of blend that in. Maybe at least that's generally what I got in mind, and which means that I don't have a clue which way we'll finally <laughs> wind up going. Uh, I mentioned when we uh, got through three. It, that that really is a point where uh, some folks don't stop. Pro- probably a couple reasons for it looks to me like. One is that with the first three steps, it, it's, it's pretty easy to shuck and jive on those things. <laughs> and uh, pretty easy to kid ourselves on too because they're, they're, they're spirit things. They're, they're something that there's no real tangible evidence. So, you know, it's something you have in your heart and your mind, and uh, if you got it, you know, you, you, you know you, you, that's a thing. You know what you feel or don't feel, or what you feel clear and solid about. But from this point forward, it the, the, the game changes a little bit, and it's pretty easy to tell in in four and five and on in that there's some actions that take place that are pretty concrete actions. Uh, real easy to take a, uh, to tell whether you've taken a four step or not. You read it. <laughs> if you've got something and you wrote on it to the best of your ability uh, about yourself, you've done it. And if you and if you hadn't, you hadn't. About as cold as that. The uh, you might have done something else, but in terms of the twelve step. The fourth step laid out in, in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is uh, here we start to get down to cases and uh, time to go to work. <clears throat> and I don't I don't think it's it's any any mistake that it comes where it does. And, and those first three steps give us the, the 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 hope and the will and the courage and the feeling of support to make some pretty drastic moves. And if, if you're anything like me, I, uh, you know, that, that whole idea 
of examining my life instead of somebody else's was new thinking for me. And uh, I had never really done any major league soul searching or evaluation. I've had other people try to probe me, but I had never tried to examine anything about what was going on with this guy. And um, so fourth step was something that just kind of loomed there for me. And I did fourth step, for the first fourth step I did, like many things that I did in this program, didn't mean to. I had didn't, didn't mean to do it when I did it. And, uh, and the way it happened with me, as I mentioned last, last night, I, I was always a reader. I, you know, I was always somebody who, who uh, and I still am. You know, the first thing I did was, I told was read the, the, the stuff. And I, I just, in, by instinct, read stuff. And uh, so in AA, I, I was no different. I read all the stuff. And so I understood the exercises that were laid out. But that doesn't do much. And uh, so I was... I was reading and listening to what was going on. I wasn't eagerly hunting anything out. And then one day, I went to a meeting, and nothing out of the ordinary as far as I was concerned. It was just written to another meeting. I was around nine months, somewhere in there. And uh, they, they had a speaker. That, we had a speaker that day. I don't know if anybody asked him to do it, but he spent the entire meeting on the fourth step. That was all he talked about. Didn't tell his story at all. Just talked about that step for a, for a, for a solid hour. And he went into it with as great a detail as I've ever heard with how to do it, when to do it, where to do it. He stressed the importance of writing the inventory. And he, he read part of it out of the book you know, and, 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 and went into great stuff about his experience in doing it. And so, when he got through with that, I was moved into doing it. Now, now I'd been doing a, I'd been doing a little bit of mental inventory taking, you know, quite naturally. You know, I'd sit there in a the group and I'd listen to somebody tell their story, and it would naturally trigger some things with me, and I'd think back, and and I was really, really. You know, trying to get some feel for what had happened in my life. And, uh, boss, we're going to let you make up later. <laughs> we, yeah, I was trying to get some feel, and what I was really looking for was, was uh, an explanation about how such a nice fellow as me got in such a mess. It's really what I wanted to find. And, and so what I intended to do when I wrote the inventory was to uh, to get into that. Now, I had a couple of theories. I, I know you probably never had any theories about how your train got off the track, but, <laughs> but I sure did. And, I, you know, they sound goofy when you, when you get past them, but they make sense at the time. Like, I was in the jail business one time, and I had a guy that wanted to do r research on how being ugly affected criminal behavior. And I said, now that's a great idea. You know, his notion was that if you're ugly enough, you can't make it in the world, so you just kind of shortcut by bulldogging your way. So I let him go at it. And uh, I guess one reason I went at it is that I was somewhat that way when I started thinking about what went wrong with me. I, uh, I, I'll just tell you a couple of, of examples of stuff that... You, you probably haven't noticed it being kind-hearted people. But I have some rather impressive ears. I mean, some people say they're big. But I think they're impressive. I, I mean, those suckers. <laughs> they, and they are big, by golly. And they have been this big all of my life. I mean, as a little kid, can you imagine an eight-year-old boy with something like this strapped on his head? Man, I looked like I had two pancakes flapping up there. And, uh, and your kids are kind, you know, when, when they see somebody who has a little odd characteristic. And they, they used to call me Dumbo. And uh, it looked like a taxi going down the door, uh, street with both doors open. 
And, uh, oh, you know, a sensitive child is affected by stuff like that. And, and at one point I was thinking, well, you know, I think that's what it was. I, I was just odd enough that I was sort of socially inhibited or something by uh, <laughs> the crew of people around me. And uh, I don't think that would last it long. But at one point that made sense. And there were others. And I'll tell you the one I was in at the time I started to do inventory. Now, this is an extremely touching story. I, you, you, you <coughs> may have your sleeve ready now because you, you're going to need it. Uh, my, <laughs> I came from a broken home. Now, that's just a tragic thing in itself. It wasn't broken. My dad just left it, you know, and, and, and he walked off when I was four years old. I didn't have a clue where he was going. But I knew he was was not coming back. I don't know why. I mean, nobody told me that, but I saw that guy walking down the street, and I knew that that was the end of that for some reason. And now, no big deal. No big deal. If you had asked me about that in my formative years, in my teenage years, in my drunken years, in the first many years of my sobriety, I would have said, no big deal. If you would have asked me about my father, I'd have said there ain't none. You know, you know, there was, but there's not any. No factor. I tell you, you don't do that to a four-year-old kid without some real impact. <clears throat> and so, now that was bad enough. The worst was, my mother found another one <laughs> and brought that sucker home. And I'm telling you, <laughs> I try not to just instantly dislike folk. But I, did, I failed on him. I, I mean, I just didn't like that dude the day he drove up. No offense to short people, but he was just a little old stump of a guy <laughs> and a real maggot. Man, I mean, that guy was <laughs> bad news. And it, I mean, you, you see people like, that are just cruddy people. That, they, they just it, Nothing he did. He was just obscene, uh, just for being there. And, uh, and, I mean, I really didn't like him. And, and we, uh, he, he, when he came in, I was little enough that I had to call that thing Daddy. <laughs> Jesus. Every time I called that sucker Daddy, I mean, my temper here would just go up. My sister was old enough, she called the thing Alvin. And, uh, I, I, it was awkward, you know, and and this guy was crude. You know, he he seemed to think that his life's mission was to 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 live in every town in my state. And Frank knows something about Gastonia, the, the Gaston County, where, where I grew up. They had 135 mills in that county. He wanted to work every one of them, I believe. Because he was one of those highly refined people that you see on jobs. That when he got frustrated, he didn't go to the ombudsman or, or you know, to go and register a complaint. He'd cut the foreman or something, you know, or just cuss him out or walk off or something. And then go get another job doing the same thing in a new town. I majored in changing schools as going through, through that thing. And uh, so it was a it was an aggravating thing. And so when I started, if you if you think about all of the related stuff to that, yeah, that every year it's a matter of breaking in a new school, making out, letting a whole new bunch of people know who you are and what your limits are and all that kind of stuff. Never really getting close to associations with people. Well, I kind of seriously dwelt on that. When I started hearing people talk a little about causation, you know, and what drives the, 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 the illness, and, and so I kind of settled on that. And, and, and that guy was formidable in my mind. You know, I, I always promised myself, I, I never did get to do this, but I promised myself if I ever got big enough, I was going to whoop that sucker, I mean big time. I meant to go take it to him. And uh, I never did get to. The old fool died. And uh, the best thing ever happened to him, they buried him down in South Carolina. 
I'd go by there every once in a while just to make sure he hadn't clawed out or something like that. <laughs> I tell you, I, I really don't like that cat. I, I don't even like him dead. I really don't like that dude. And uh, so, now to, to the untrained eye, that would look like a resentment, I imagine. That, <laughs> that, maybe it is. <laughs> Whatever it is, I'm keeping it, I tell you. <laughs> but that's what I was thinking about, you know, with stuff like that. And, of course, anybody who grew up under that kind of an influence would have to be a little strange. And I was. So, so that's what I meant to do, you know. You know, that guy talked about the inventory, and I was right at that point where old Alvin was my diagnosis. Now, I know now how stupid that was. You know, I'm a grown fellow, supposedly. Six feet tall, over 200 pounds. And I've, I've got a dwarf. You know, <laughs> I'm frustrated because I can't whoop. Well, now, that made sense. <laughs> as long as I was just thinking about it. <laughs> as long as I didn't let anybody hear or even see what I'm thinking about, including me. That made imminent sense. <laughs> I've had stranger concepts. I sat when I left that meeting, went back to the to my Thursday where I live, went back to my cell, sat on that old bunk, took out the obligatory legal pad, and I started to write. Now this was how refined my process of inventory was. Took out that pad, started to write a little story about Alvin and how cruel life was and what a victim of circumstances I was. I wrote two lines, absolutely two lines, no more. And then with no intent whatsoever, I mean none, something happened. Now, it wasn't resounding, it wasn't anything dramatic in, in my mind, but something happened that truly was dramatic because I came, it was like I hit a wall. And all at once, I came to that point that, that I guess we all come to, that some of us call it a moment of clarity, some of us call it a moment of truth. But I came to that point that the writer talks about when a person comes face to face with himself. And I saw for the first time in my life, now I didn't analyze it or anything like that, but I saw the charade that was my life. I saw the sham. I saw the delusion. I didn't understand it. But I saw what I was looking at it was just this illusion of stuff. And, and with no intent whatsoever, when I had that kind of awareness in one motion, I mean, I didn't even change posture. In one motion, I just opened up and started to pour out my life. That's all. It was not columns. It was not analytical. It was not real thoughtful. What it was was a, a tortured young guy just sort of pouring out stuff that had been buried in my life forever. I had never taken an honest look at me in my entire life. I had been so busy doing what I was doing, I never stopped to evaluate what was happening. I was in over my head long before I knew it and never really stopped to regroup or try to get a new hold on things or anything like that. I just rushed headlong through life. And, and, and so I just opened up. And, and when I did, it was, it was just like that ocean coming in. It was unstoppable. I could not have not taken an inventory at that time had I wanted to. Well, it, it was like some folks call that a cathartic experience. I was just, just pouring out. And when I finished, I had three pages of hopeless scribble. Barely legible to me. Not legible at all to anybody else. But then nobody else is supposed to see it. That was mine. And when I got through with it, it didn't look like much from a literary standpoint. And nothing changed. I was in the same cell, I was in the same place. 
but I've never been the same man. Because something fundamentally important happened to me. I, I mentioned last night, I just kind of alluded to it, about what uh, Silkworth talked about, about frothy emotional appeal not being enough, that, that, that we have to have a solution that has depth and weight. That was where depth and weight started to be a factor in my life. Because what happened that day was I knew, I knew without question that I was alcoholic. It was no longer academic. It was no longer acknowledgement. It was no longer a guilty plea. I knew that I was alcoholic. Period. Not the young guy, not the whiz kid, not the tragic case. I'm an alcoholic. I knew that at a cellular level. Tremendously important. That inventory was the most important day's work this old boy has ever done. Bar none. I mean bar none. I've, I've spent a million dollars in one day one time with somebody else's money. But I spent it, it was a big responsibility. It pales in comparison to the importance of that day's work. The day my wife and I were, were married, very important day. It doesn't hold a candle. When my son was born, my daughter, my career started, my career was completed, none even come close. Because every one of those things suspends from what happened that day. Every one of them. None of them would have happened had I not reached that point of absolute resolution about who I am. And what happened that day? I mentioned it when I was, when I was, was talking about the first step that, and that, that business of kind of groping around and trying to get to a point. And, that you, and it had to sink the hook a little, little bit more. What happened that day was there's a place in the book that uh, I can come close on this one. It, it's, it says something pretty close to this. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. That's the first step in recovery. Yeah, that's written in a lot of other stuff about our, our characteristics and, and about the defining thing of we're folks who have lost the ability to control our drinking. But what that one says is what gets to the heart and soul of this whole business of starting a new life in recovery. Had to concede. You know, concede is a great word. Concede is a very private word. It's a personal word. You know, concede is an inside job. You know, I've told you every time I've got up here, I think, uh, 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 that I'm Tom Ivers or an alcoholic. That's got nothing to do with concede. That's communication. That's communication. That's saying you and I have a common meeting ground. Nothing to do with the therapy of the first step. Nothing to do with the therapy of surrender. The concede is when I recognize deep down that it's over. It's over. Now, there was a pretty good fight, but I lost. I lost. I got knocked colder than a mackerel. And I accept deep, deep down that that's what happened. I'm beat. I'm not a guy who wised up and decided sober is better than drunk. I'm not a guy who fell in love with a new affection and a fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's a benefit. I'm a guy who went to the privacy of his own soul and said, man, I'm done. Fight's over. It's over. And it hasn't come back. Now, I've revisited obsession. I'm an alcoholic. I didn't used to be. I have the mind of a chronic alcoholic because that's what I am. And my mind can and has turned irresistibly to the thought of a drink more than once. But I haven't drunk. Why? 
because I found a power <coughs> that's, that's sufficient to deal with something that I can't deal with. The fight's over. It doesn't remove me from the, the vicissitudes of life. It doesn't remove me from the firing line. But it relieves any notion I might have. Let me, let me give you an example. Of thing that, that The first time that I ever really knowingly encountered uh, an obsession, I was, uh, I, was, I was flying somewhere. And this was a long back, a long time back before I started doing it on a regular basis. That, but I had to fly somewhere. And, and it was the first jet plane that, that I'd ever been on. And uh, they invented them while I was drunk. And I, and I woke up, they're flying with no propellers. <laughs> and so I got on one, and, and I imagine I was probably a little excited about that, but no, I mean, no big deal. And uh, so I got on that plane. Now, I'm a guy, I'm, I'm probably just under four years old. I'm a guy that's as active in AA as it's possible to be. If you could be any more active, you'd have to not sleep. I mean, I was absolutely wound up. I was, I was, I was as enthused about Alcoholics as I was I'd ever been. I'd been to a meeting the night before I got on that airplane. I was going to one the night when I got off. Nothing big. No presenting difficulties that I knew anything about. I'm just another fat cat sitting on a on an airplane. When we got up, just as, you know how they do. That thing just got up to altitude, started to straighten out, and they started selling that hooch. Yeah. And uh, they they put that buggy out. And I've heard that God knows how many times. But you know what I mean when I say I heard that. I don't mean I heard that. I heard that. And uh, they started telling people what they had. You know, like folks ask them, "What do you what, what do you got?" Like they didn't know. And, <laughs> <laughs> what we got bourbon today or scotch. And, and all at once that thing grabbed me. And I was absolutely overwhelmed with the first obsession that I knew I had. I might have had them when I was drinking, but I didn't know it. But the, for the first time, I was absolutely overpowered with, with an, an obsession to drink. I knew I was going to drink. I knew that. And fellow alcoholics, I did not want to drink. It wasn't an issue of wouldn't a drink be nice. What I'm talking about is a gut-wrenching obsession, not goofy thinking. And I wasn't thinking, well, who would know I'm 30,000 feet in the air? That didn't enter the picture. Well, I'm in a dilemma. I reached in my pocket, took out a dollar bill. That's what a drink cost back then. That's, you can tell how long ago that's been. And, uh, by the way, it was 12 people on the last plane that uh, bought drinks. <laughs> Four bucks a throw. <laughs> Not that I noticed. Now, I, I, I would just... You never know. There may be candidates on there. I've, I've met a lot of strange people on the plane. They... they uh, that, that here they come, yeah, and, and they're announcing that, and I'm sitting there with that dollar in my pocket. What do you do? What do you do? It's real good to ponder that question because our book says that this is an occurrence that will happen with alcoholics. What do you do? Well, one that I found is that you get ready before you face it. And so I'm sitting there sweating, and I'm thinking, what do you do? You call your sponsor? They didn't have phones back then. Not on planes. Catch a meeting? <laughs> Go talk to a fellow member? <laughs> Forget it. There's going to come a time when you're in that lonesome valley, and that's where I was. What do you do? Well, I thought back to things I'd heard. Like, when you're really up against it, remember your last drunk. Remember that. And I thought back, and I remembered my last drunk, a king-sized mess. Thanks for the memory, but that's not enough. 
bad memories weaken over the years, and they're not enough. And so it, it was, a, it was a, a thought. And then I remembered what I'd often heard. When you're right up against it and you don't know where to turn, pray. I didn't even know how to do that when I got here. But I learned. And what I did, I prayed the simplest yet most powerful prayer that man's ever uttered. I said, God help me. From deep down. And I meant that. And that obsession was gone as quickly as it came. I've dealt with two or three others. That 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 um, the power. You know, that to me is the power of understanding at depth about alcoholism, so that it wasn't a mental joust with with the deal. It wasn't rationalizing and all this kind of stuff. My core says, friend, you can't do that, and I don't have to debate it at that level. That debate is over. And the rest of it is accommodating the things that I, that I run into in the world. That's why I say that was such a tremendously important day for me. Because it closed the door on that. Good fight, I lost. I have a, a good friend, had a good friend uh, uh, that uh, had, had died a while back, 48 years in the program. He uh, He always had a way of kind of summing up. I always like to sit in a meeting with him because he always had a great way of summing up at the end of it. And he would talk about the difference between I won't drink and I can't drink. What a difference, eh? I won't drink, is a, is, that's a closed fist statement. I'm not going to drink. I can't drink is a peaceful statement. And there's no fight. And that was a product of that, of that four step. The other thing that happened that day was um, that I became a real member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the funny, funny thing about how just a, a, what seemed like a pretty little thing like that. I had never really felt that, that I belonged in AA for real. I was always uncomfortable. Yes. And, 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 and when what happened that day was that that stuff happened. You know, the way I look at it, I, I just sort of have mental pictures of things. You know, if you think about Alcoholics Anonymous and who we are sitting here today, you know, when this thing started out with Bill and Bob back in Akron, and then they got another guy named, named, named Bill, uh, Bill, and... And what happened was that there started to be a chain of people who came through Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's a, it's a tragic chain. It's a tragic chain of human misery. And what we have coming through Alcoholics Anonymous are people who've been beaten by the weapons of life. Maybe self-imposed. What difference does it make? But what we deal with are people who come through with the tragic faces Reflecting what brought them here. And a lot of people pass through here and barely slow down. Some never catch on that there's a solution here. A lot of others catch on and for some reason can't hold on. I don't know why. I don't know why. And the, the few, some, and thank God, so far I'm one of them, are able to grab hold of this thing. I like to call it a brass ring of sobriety. To grab hold of that thing and hold on and ride it to a new life. And that's what happened. You know, that, that's where that stuff started to solidify for me. And I became a real member. From that day to this day, I have never gone to one single meeting, including this one, without knowing 100% why I'm there. Not a single one. 
I have never gone to a meeting and been in a lost space in a crowd. Not another single time. I've no longer been the guy sitting there in a world of his own. When I walk in, I'm connected to the world around me. As some of us were, were talking at lunch about, there's some important products that come from that, I think. We were talking about the uh, thing we run into sometimes with the varying levels of friendliness in groups. And and some groups are just not warm and welcoming. You know, that, uh, you know some groups don't have a, a sort of a... a, 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 a a feel of belonging enough to welcome who's a visitor because you can't tell who's a visitor. So anyway, there's a lot of times that that even though we may want to be warm and welcome, we don't come across that way. And uh, and I tell you, I do my level best to not put up with unfriendly groups. And I don't mean I chew them out or something, but if I go into a meeting, if the, if somebody there. They don't want their hand shook. They better put it in the pocket, because I'm gonna go after them if I can. And uh, it's a, it's an important thing, you know, if you want to be in a good welcoming position in Alcoholics Anonymous. And some of it comes out of what I'm talking about: of this thing of getting resolved to who I am and where I belong, and not looking for somebody else to take care of me and make me comfortable. I, I went into a, to a club that I was telling the guys about. Went into a club up in uh, in uh, Richmond, Virginia. I mean, there's nothing scandalous about it. And uh, I <laughs> I was up there on business, and and, uh, and they was, in the afternoon I had some time, so I dropped over to the club and uh, walked in, and it was a typical mid-afternoon uh, club crowd. They all sitting around shooting the bull and playing cards and goosing each other and stuff. And now I'm a fairly decently dressed fellow. Not that that ought to make a difference, but sometimes it does. And so I, I went in. And I was like the psychiatrist in the burlesque show. I'm, I'm watching the crowd, you know. I'm not still the performers. <laughs> and uh, so I went in, and I did the polar opposite of what I normally do. I walked in and deliberately, physically brushed against every person in the room. Every single one. Not one single person even acknowledged that I walked by. Went over to the coffee bar, sat down, and the guy working was, was talking with another guy down to the other end of the bar. I sat there a few minutes, came down and said, you want something? <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, I'd like a coffee. And so I gave him a dime, but he bought, bought the coffee. And uh, I got up and walked out. Now, that's not me. But isn't that a message, though? Isn't that a message? I went over to the hotel and, and finished up, and then I, I changed up. I was going, coming, coming back and going to a, to a meeting, but I went by the club, and I was going to hook up with somebody. I walked in, and I did my normal thing. <laughs> I went over and interrupted every card game, <laughs> every conversation, I went around, made the round, shook every hand that didn't run, and uh, different club, eh? Different club. And it's not a matter of revolutionizing them. It's a matter that I'm not going to let somebody make a, a an unfriendly place if I can help it. Because I'm a member here. I depend on this. I don't want it to deteriorate into a house of strangers. I want it to be a place where if somebody walks in, they're going to feel the warmth of a reception. I want that to happen. And because I want it to happen, it's my responsibility to help make it happen. So I do that. Yeah, I went, <laughs> I went to, a, to a meeting down my way in, in North Carolina a while back uh, speaking at a group. And I usually kind of worked the crowd a little bit before the meeting. I, it mainly it just sort of helped me feel loose and get communicated, you know. And so I just sort of walk around and, and fat mouth the folks. And I went over and, and met one lady. And then after I made the circle a bit more, she chased me down. And she said, uh, can I ask you something? <laughs> I said, well, yeah. What? She said, what do you sell? <laughs> I said, 
Well, nothing. Re- I said, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah, I do. I said, I sell recovery. And we got a heck of a deal on that. <laughs> but now, see, now that's important to me. I don't know whether that means anything to you or not. But that means a great deal to me. Remember why I told you I came to my second meeting? I saw signs of life. I saw a guy who communicated that, hey, guy, come on in. There's life here. Now, I don't know that I would have been recruited into a, to a, a morgue or you know, whatever that looked like. And so when I'm a member, you know, I have a sense of responsibility to not only make it comfortable for me, but for the people around me. And, and so that's a big, big difference from a guy like me who was isolated, who was locked in his, himself. And I don't do that stuff just because I'm Dale Carnegie reincarnated or anything. I'm somebody who, if I let my instincts take me, I'll go to the corner. And I haven't done that for a lot of years. But I don't have a new mind. I've got a new, set, a new way of life. And I'm not on automatic pilot to glow. And so, if I'm out making people feel welcome, I can't help but feel welcome. And so, it's just a simple little thing. But, but that was a fundamental change that happened in me in my relationship to what I'm doing in Alcoholics Anonymous. I got down to business. Instead of being a guy lost in, the, in just another nameless face in the crowd, I became a guy on a mission. I'm a guy with a purpose. Excuse me. <laughs> you, you ran Ron off. <laughs> The other thing that um, that uh, that happened in that in that forced that for me, and it, it it was pretty doggone pivotal in a lot of ways. That even at the crude level, I started to see some of what was out of whack with this guy. Even at the crude level of of, of that inventory, started to see a little bit. When I did my second one, I saw a great deal more. Because a searching and fearless moral inventory takes in a whole bunch of ground. And, and, and what I found uh, over time, starting with that first one and then solidified in the second one, was that, you know, in, in a way I like, to, I like to think about it. You know, I think that every person rides a tiger. Everybody rides a tiger. Now, they're not all the same. You know what I'm talking about. We've all got certain makeups and conditions that drive how we do. And sometimes that tiger is a peaceful dude. Sometimes he's snarling and snapping, you know, but, but he's always there. And, and in a way, that's what the defects of character were about in my life. You know, I was a guy, as, as I indicated in, in the beginning when I was talking about that sort of development of the illness, you know, I was a guy who was really uh, uh, emotionally wrecked. And I developed some real strong, you could call them habits, we call them defects of character. I, I developed some mechanisms, I guess you could say, by which I coped with life. They were what pulled me through. They were what I used to drag through life. Now, I didn't plan it that way. But nobody can live with just being miserable and uncomfortable. And so I adapted behaviors that in some ways I guess were compensating for the way I felt, regardless of what it was. I developed some pretty pretty uh, destructive kind of traits. I became a liar, for example. I mean, I don't mean that I learned to lie. I became a liar. And I got to a point where my basic instinct was to lie. I didn't have to make one up. It was automatic. Now, I say was, I still would be that way if I didn't practice what we do here. Because, I swear to God, I believe 
Anytime somebody gets me in a tight situation and I got to answer quick, I have never once blurted out the truth. <laughs> it, it just isn't there. Now, I, I blurt out a lie in a heartbeat. It, it is just an automatic thing. It, I, I've, I've often said, I believe it's true. I think if somebody awakened me at 3 o'clock in the morning in my own bed, in my own home, and said, what are you doing here? I'll guarantee you I'd hit the floor lying. It's clean and why It was just an instinct. You don't have to make it up. It just happens. And, uh, and that, uh, that, that thing of, 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 of overcompensating by the, the, the way I would try to take over stuff and that, that animated kind of behavior of, the, the, of trying to deny what I was really like. And, and, and so the defects of character that were part of my life, if it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't have had the character because that's all there was. And uh, so at first, I thought, when I first started looking at that stuff, I thought de- defects of character were bad behavior. You know, that, that's what I thought that meant. And I thought when we did an inventory, I was supposed to do, well, what did I do here and who was the victim of it and that kind of thing. I never did get at first to that point of trying to see where did that come from within me? What is it that makes that an automatic response with me? And so the defect of character is the thing that drives my life. And those were deep-seated things. They they weren't things that were going to yield real easy. I had some things that were deeply personal and deeply troubling. Now, that whole business about my relationship with organized religion, that, that was a very disturbing thing, both when in my active belligerence and in my early recovery. I found it extremely difficult to, to bridge that gap in that relationship. I went back into organized, well, sort of, I went back into um, church for the first time when I was 11 years sober. And for me, I was right about on time. Took some healing, took some doing, took some amends with the organized religion before I could start doing anything in that regard. Relationship with my mother. I won't go into a whole bunch of detail here, but that I wouldn't mind, but it, but it, it just won't. But that, hey, Joe, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. That uh, maybe amends and I might talk about it a little bit. But the uh, those are troubling things. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know if they leapt on the paper for you or if they will when you get to doing it, but there, there were things to be dug out that were deep-seated things that, 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 that provoked a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of guilt, a lot of, of the things that consumed me as I drove through life in a way that had little regard for other people. And so looking at the things that not only about what happened when I drank and all that kind of stuff, but looking at what drove my life and what is it that I'll deal with for the rest of my life was awfully important if I was to ever know any peace. And so when I got through with uh, that first inventory, that was a, I, I was a guy with a, 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 with a great experience in hand. And, and when I got through, I, uh, I needed to take the fifth step. I didn't want to particularly, but I needed to. And, and, you know, it was on my mind. I had gotten that stuff out. I'd had a, a meaningful experience in that. And I needed to tell somebody. And I'd read the book. I mean, I understood what, what followed. And, and it was that same old business of being scared to death to do it. I started thinking of people to get. I lived in a fairly small community. They were... <laughs> They were, uh, well, there were 6,000 inhabitants there and, uh, and almost that many keeping them there. So there was a big crowd. Uh, most of them, I really, even though I trusted some, I didn't want to get into deep, intimate, fifth-step type conversation. And so I started thinking about them. And I couldn't think of a soul. I, I, I had a guy that I was real close to. He, was a, he wasn't a sponsor, but he was, a, he was another guy in the group, and he was a, a wonderful fellow. Uh, he was a wise counselor. Not a counselor, but he was a wise counselor. And, and, and so I kept talking with him. And everybody we would think of, I would just categorically dismiss. 
And yeah, it's not the right one. And this brilliant alcoholic mind, it took me two months to realize I'm talking to the guy I ought to talk to. <laughs> Incredible genius here. I got and now in the book it says that we should be very careful about um, who we take the step with and about the conditions and all that kind of stuff, and I was. I sat down with that fellow on a, what looked like a park bench on the yard of a maximum custody penitentiary with folks wandering all over the place like cattle, and we sat down, and I opened up, opened up. That was the first time that any human on this planet ever had a look at me. I mean, nobody knew me, nobody. And for the first time in my life, I let another human have a peek. And it was a wonderful experience, a wonderful experience. Some people say it's kind of blah. Mine surely was not. Mine was 4th of July. When I got through with that thing, I was a man freed. I was a man liberated. And when I left that and went back to, to, uh, to, uh, to, my, to my cell, I was absolutely floating. felt so good. And, and what it represented for me was, was not just like confession and getting it off your chest. What that was for me was the first crack in that prison of, of isolation and self-centered confinement that I'd been in all my life. It wasn't about the weight being dumped and the garbage being taken out, not at all. What it was was a chink in the armor of breaking that thing. I thought about the, that Berlin Wall over there. When the, do you remember when that thing went down? And and always had a kind of a poignant kind of a, a, of a similarity to the experience when I watched those folk over there pecking on that wall. <coughs> Excuse me. Looked like a futile effort, but the wall came down. Yeah. <coughs> and that's sort of the excuse me, the way this experience was. You know, that was a tiny crack, but it was the first crack I'd ever known in that wall that had kept me totally isolated from people around me. And marvelous, marvelous experience. The, uh, when, uh, when I got through, I'd, I was never somebody that was just eager to jump on stuff. And, uh, Demonstrated by my behavior. You know, back back then, I don't think I mentioned this when we were talking about history earlier. But back then, it was pretty much the case. Yeah, I think I did mention that nobody did stuff like we're doing here. You know, that I never. It, it just didn't exist. You know, and nobody took people through steps or anything like that. It was sort of a let's talk about it and big bang theory and and you know do it if you can, and so it was not it was not any kind of an organized kind of a driven effort, that it, and 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 so a lot of mine just sort of came when 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 the sense of urgency was there, and and when I started looking at uh, at six and seven, <laughs> at my first thought was. That this is filler material. Yeah. And it really did seem like a restatement of what we'd just gotten through with. And uh, I said, well, good God, what is this? Big deal. And uh, then I bothered to look at it. <laughs> and did I ever change my mind? Because what I found was, at least what it came out meaning for me, is that this is not throwaway material. It is probably... The, I think it may be the most critical transition in all of AA. I think it might. Because the agenda changes. The agenda changes. And it shifts from what am I, you know, how hopeless am I? What am I about? And now it shifts to what do I want to do? We were entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character and we humbly ask Him to do so. What do you want to do? You want to stay sick? You want to get well? 
Are you willing to take the actions that it takes to bring the change and are you willing to accept the change? And those were the kinds of things that started to ring in my head and I wasn't real sure that I did. I really did have that kind of lingering fear that I'm, I'm going to turn into something I don't want to turn into. And, I, and that sure looked definitive enough. Get rid of every defect of character. Good God. What thought? And Joe finally, finally got to it. There, you know, some people, it always helps me to get a little bit of clarity on what I'm talking about. The, uh, and in my simple way of kind of sorting this stuff out, a lot of times folks will argue over or debate or quibble over uh, what's the difference between short uh, uh, defects and shortcomings? And it probably all kind of takes on that. I'll tell you what what, what mine is. There, there's a place in the in the in the, in the Bible where reference is made to sins of commission and sins of omission. And to me, that's sort of what we're talking about in this transition of defects of character and shortcomings. That it's two sides of a coin to me. You know, some folks say Bill didn't want to use the same word twice. I think it's two different deals. You know, defects of character are, are the visible evidence of what I'm about. Defects of character are what's reflected in my behavior and what I do. Shortcomings is what I don't do. And sometimes they're just a, well, I'll give, give you an example of that. I, you know, I, like a lot of people, when I uh, came in, in the, the program, I, I, I love to say that I never hurt anybody but myself. I had the decency to be away. You know, I had the decency to be gone. I had the decency not to go to somebody's doorstep very often. When I started looking at behaviors, when I started to do inventory, I took a look at that deal with my mother. Now certainly there were some things that were deeply troubling that I did <clears throat> that were, 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 quote, sins of commission. I remember one time I went there to heal up, and that's usually what I'd do. I'd go there and heal up and then go fight again. And uh, I was in there for a pit stop, and I had a need to, to go somewhere. <clears throat> she worked a third shift in a mill. And uh, <clears throat> she only had one car. I didn't have any. So I told her I needed to make an urgent trip and uh, would be back. And I came back three days later. Yeah. In the course of it, <clears throat> she's walking to work. That's commission. But in, in the real sense of the word, it's probably not the gravest harm. <clears throat> See, I might have been generous and thoughtful by being away. All I did was deprive that lady of a son. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I, I've, I've never been a mother, but but from what I've seen of watching mothers mother, there's no more powerful thing, no more powerful relationship in the world. <laughs> it means everything. I always get a kick out of my wife, who is uh, maturely loving our son. Uh, he's a <laughs> he's a 32 year old physician out in the, in Memphis. <laughs> While back, he was driving somewhere uh, up, and it had been gone from our house a long time. And she she said to me, "You know, I think Tom is probably right about this point on the map." <laughs> I kept listening to that. I said, "Isn't it a little bit difficult driving that car and it's 500 miles away?" <laughs> I just said, go, boy, you know, go get them. And, 
that's the difference, you know. <laughs> but with mothers, that's a special thing. <clears throat> and see, all I did was take that away. Commission is more than neglect. It's a failure to, to, to respond, a failure to provide, a failure to take responsibility. And so when, when I look at those, those defects and shortcomings, big time stuff, and, and what we're talking about are those things that are going to keep me from living the full life of recovery. I can't come in here and work both sides of the street. I can't keep doing the same old junk and expect a new life to superimpose. And so what those steps say to, say, say, steps say to me is, hey, it's time to take some action. You want to get better, don't you? You want to change, or don't you? It's decision time. I, 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 you know, I, it's a strange thing, but it's absolutely true. I didn't get the instant, act, instant response to that that I expected when I started making that decision or becoming ready. I have personally, personally, never solved one single problem in Alcoholics Anonymous. With all the years that I put in, with all the geniuses that I've talked with, with all of the marvelous meetings and seminars and workshops, not one single time have I found myself saying, that's it, I've got it, problem solved, not once. Not one single time have I, have I found a way to resolve defects of character. It doesn't work that way, does it? You know, what I found is that when I came in, my life was absolutely filled with defects of character. That's all there was. And if, if you had put it on a balance deal, you know, if, if, you'd have, if, if it had been balanced like a scale, when I came in, it would have been like that with me. The defects of character were my life. Now, I've never found a remedy for hate, for example. But I had a lot of hate. Some of it not even directed to anybody, but I, I just had a lot of anger. And I've never found a solution for that. But what I found is that as I practice this way of life, as I interact with my fellows in the program, lo and behold, what happens? I start to get introduced to love. I learned to love in Alcoholics Anonymous for the first time in my life in a real, responsible, mature way. I never have solved hate, but what I've done is learned to love. And what it does is balance the scales, you know. Sometimes, just like a deal like this, you know, we take some time out and we go to the beach and we just sort of shut out the world and experience something and we get close. Sometimes I leave a thing like this and I'm so full of love that I could fly the plane by myself, you know. That I'm, just, I'm just loaded. And that's what happens, Joe. It's not a matter of solving problems or, or did it that. It's a matter of, of taking the actions, of, made, of practicing the principles in, in my affair, doing the actions, and then what happens is that it, it sort of, and most of the time it tears, eh? You know, sometimes I get aggravated and it'll balance a little bit, you know, because what I get restored to is life. I don't, uh, I don't transcend life to some supernatural condition. I have the same kinds of slings and arrows. Everybody does. And so most of the time I just kind of bounce along. And, and that's been the way the process... I guess that's why we call it a process, a, a, a journey, eh? That's what we're talking about. It is a journey. It isn't a problem solver. Not only... I'll throw in one other thing. Not only have I never solved a problem in Alcoholics Anonymous, I ain't working on none. I'm not working on any. I have literally found that when I work on problems, I make them worse. 